Starbase is bursting with activities, including IFT4. The first quarter analysis of worldwide satellite launches is out. We have news on IM6, as well as from ESA regarding both Euclid results and the rookie astronauts to the ISS. We shall conclude the episode with seven launches this week. Hi everyone, and welcome to your channel All About Space with me, Christophe Paget. Let us review what is up at Starbase, starting with Massey's site. Last week, I've mentioned the ship number 31 fire during cryogenic test at Massey's. It turned out to be caused by an electrical fault near the valve, with the raceways being dislodged from the ship fuselage. Therefore, SpaceX was inspecting also ship number 29, the one to be used for the IFT number 4. Now, we do not know any more than that. From an aerial view, the site is being fitted with more tanks and preparation for the static fire test area. And you can see a rundown of the various equipment already fitted there. At the launch site, further relocation of the Mekazila Tower number two sections is continuing. So far, five sections have been transported from the nearby port to the launch site. And the fourth remaining vertical tank in the tank farm has now been removed and chopped up. What is good news is that explosives for the flight termination systems has been delivered to the site, which means the flight IFT number four is closed. Well, Elon Musk and his Elon Time has mentioned on X.com that the IFT number four is expected in the next two weeks, meaning the first week of June. Separately, the FAA has advertised the two possible ways of a license could be granted. The first one is through the IFT3 mishap report closure, whilst the second avenue is through the safety assessment of IFT3 risk to people and property. The point being made here is that IFT3 has landed as planned, re-entered the atmosphere as planned in a safe area, so repeating the same flight path would pose no risk to people or property, and therefore license could be granted on that basis, whilst the mishap report could be finalized after IFT4. Now it seems these two options are available to SpaceX, according to the FAA. A second and probably final wet dress rehearsal was successfully carried out on ship 29 and booster 11, what is expected to be carried out next is completing the thermal protection tile bonding on ship 29 and updating any further improvement from IFT3 analysis onto IFT4 vehicles. The suborbital farm continues to be removed and some of the towns are being relocated to Massey's site as the new home for Starship static fire testing. At the production site, SpaceX is assembling a new booster demonstrator named B14.1. More to come on this in the coming weeks. For the moment, it remains unclear what its true purpose is. The parking lot behind High Bay is progressing well, having its full height in most sections, and the famous Highway 4 facade is now complete, and from an aerial view, the Star Factory roof and building expansion seems to be completed too. The 2024 Q1 report came out, providing the tally of satellite weight to orbit by all rocket launchers. The results are expected, where SpaceX has launched 85% of the total number of satellites by weight. The rest of the world is not capable of competing with SpaceX. Now, what is going on? What is the plan to compete? Well. China is multiplying its number of launch providers significantly, such as X-Space, Orion Space, CAS Space, Deep Blue Aerospace, Galactic Energy, iSpace, Land Space, Link Space, One Space, Space Pioneer, CASC, and CASIC. Well, that's a lot of space. Even CASC is building several new rockets. Now, Australia is starting its rocket journey with Gilmore Space. 
and Europe is exploding with a dozen new launch providers working hard for their maiden flights for some as early as this year, such as RFA. But uh, we can count also High Impulse, Orbex, PLD, ISA Aerospace, Latitude, Skyrora, Ionis Space, of course, Maya Space, Avio, Space Forest, and ABL. In India, and they have no real ambition to compete with such a race. As for Russia, with the recent economic sanctions, they have no customers to support any growth. And Japan is welcoming a new provider and replacing its aging H2A rocket with a more competitive one, but far from denting on such a monopoly. Many US providers are trying collectively to compete with SpaceX, such as ULA, Blue Origin, Rocket Lab, Firefly, Stock Space, or even Relativity Space, but they are still many years before they are able to have a reusability on their rocket or first stages and to start competing with that almighty SpaceX. Well, the list is by far not exhaustive, but depicts a booming space industry in the making, so watch this space. Ion 6 launch window has now been narrowed down to the first two weeks of July 2024 from the French Guiana. So far, the first and second stages and side boosters have been assembled together back in March this year. The payload was received on May the 16th for future integration atop Ion 6 at the French Guiana spaceport. Now, the exact launch date shall be announced at the Berlin International Aeronautical Exhibition, ILA, on June the 5th through the 9th. Director General of ESA, Joseph Arschmacher, has announced exciting news for the recently graduated five ESA astronauts. He mentioned that ESA has negotiated a seat on the ISS for the five new recruits between 2026 and 2030. Now, Joseph announced the name of the two rookie astronauts who will go to the ISS in 2026. French ESA astronaut Sophie Adeno will go to the ISS in the spring of 2026, whilst Belgium ESA astronaut Raphael Biejois will follow in fall of 2026. Now, they have both gone to Houston in Texas for the specialized training to operate the ISS. So no time lost in space programs. Sophie was a flight test pilot on helicopters in the French Air Force, and Raphael is specializing in biomedical engineering and neuroscience. It seems that Europe has moved up a gear in on-orbit research, so I look forward to telling you more about it in the future. The ESA Euclid Telescope has been studying space for dark energy and dark matter for some weeks now. ESA released five never-seen-before stunning images of galaxies and celestial phenomena provided by the Euclid Telescope. They reveal an abundance of new science, enabling scientists to hunt for rogue planets, use lensed galaxies to study matter, explore the evolution of our universe, and more. We can see ABLE 2390, Messier 78, NGC 6744, ABLE 2764, including a bright star, and the Dorado group. And here is where they are all located in space. The week in space flight started on May the 18th with a Starling Batch Group 659 from a Falcon 9 rocket out of Florida. Now, the first stage was the oldest one of SpaceX's fleet, with now 21 flights under its belt after landing on a drone ship. Blue Origin then completed its seventh human spaceflight, or 25th flight of his new Shepard rocket, from Texas. Six astronauts were on board the NS-25, including the astronaut Ed Dwight, he was expected to be the first black American NASA astronaut 65 years ago, but it did not happen despite completing his training. So here he is, completing his space journey on board NS-25. On May 20th, CASC launched a Long March 2D from China for his mission Beijing 3C. 
and staying in China, the private company X-Space sent his Kaizu 11 with four satellites on board. May 22nd, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 for his mission Enbro 146 from California. Now, this was the 16th flight of his booster, which landed on a drone ship. And the weekend ended with two Falcon 9 Starship batches out of Florida for the missions Group 662 and 663. Both boosters landed on the drone ship for the 8th and 13th time respectively. Let's have the summary of rocket launches. So from January to the 23rd of May 2024, the world launched 102 rockets for which 99 were successful. So out of that, US has launched 62 successful rockets and China 23. I leave you with a picture of Mars from the eyes of the satellite ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. Along the equator of Mars, the probe called CASIS, installed on the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, has spotted a couple of interesting craters in the Valles Marineris. Now, the large crater is 4 km or 2.5 miles in diameter, as for the small one is about 1.2 km or 0.7 miles in diameter. Mars is, as you know, reddish in color. However, this probe possesses four filters to sharpen the surface and highlights subtle variations of the surface mineralogy, helping scientists to grasp Mars's geological history to understand his evolution. Thank you all for watching. I'm Christophe Paget for All About Space. See you next week. Goodbye.